ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this surprise Christmas special of the Stranger Times podcast. I'm CK slash Queeve McDonnell, and you're extremely welcome aboard. If you're a new listener, this pod is an offshoot of the Stranger Times books that I write, where I have mates of mine from the comedy circuit narrating short stories I've written in the Stranger Times world. And seeing as the ST is a newspaper based in my adopted hometown of Manchester, dedicated to reporting weird and wonderful news from around the globe, it is a strange world indeed. We didn't trail this episode at all, as to be honest, we didn't think it would happen. But luckily, I managed to get the story finished, our wonderful narrator found a gap in his insanely hectic schedule to record it, and our sound wizard Rob was able to get it edited in a ridiculously short amount of time. Why the Great Rush, you say? Well, because I wanted to get it out to the world on December 22nd. You see, while all the stories in this podcast are fictional, this one is based in a very real event. December 22nd, 2021 is the 81st anniversary of Manchester's Christmas Blitz. You see, in World War II, the Manchester and Salford areas generally didn't see that much heavy bombing, but the nights of December 22nd and 23rd were very big exceptions. On those two nights, the Luftwaffe pounded the area, resulting in heavy casualties and an awful lot of damage. While lots of men and women from Manchester would have been off at the time in the armed forces, those two nights were when the war really came home to Manchester. By the end of the first night, vast swathes of the city were aflame, and they were still putting some of the fires out when the second night of bombing began. I came to the idea for this story by an odd route. A couple of years ago, I decided to combine some research with the celebration of my birthday. So myself and about a dozen mates of mine from the comedy circuit went on a ghost tour of Manchester. There were loads of wonderful stories, some of which will no doubt appear in both the Stranger Times books and this podcast at some point, but one of the things that instantly grabbed my imagination was the mention of fire wardens. These were quite often teenagers whose job was to stand on top of buildings at night, staying vigilant for incendiary bombs falling from the sky, which they then had to either extinguish with a bucket of sand or kick off the roof. Just imagine that for a moment, being a kid standing there with the might of the Luftwaffe flying overhead, and your job is to wait for a bomb to fall from the sky. As soon as I heard it, I knew I had to find a way to use that in a story. Now, to be clear, this being a Stranger Time story, of course things do eventually go a bit woo-woo strangeness, but up until that point, it is actually pretty much factually accurate. Right down to Chorlton Mill, the building that our brave young hero is standing on. Fun fact, I know that building well as it got converted into apartments and Wonder Wife and I used to live in one. Incidentally, we found a map of the damage from the Christmas Blitz and an incendiary bomb really did hit Chorton Mill on the night of December 22nd. So yes, this is a very Manchester story and to read it, I decided to shoot for the moon and ask one of Manchester and Salford's favourite sons, Jason Manford. If you're from Britain, you'll be well aware of Jason. But for our international listeners, think... Jerry Seinfeld meets Beyonce. He is the hardest working man in showbiz, mainly because he does bloody everything. As well as being one of the premier stand-up comics touring the country, he appears in West End musicals, he's recorded albums, he acts, he presents TV shows, he has his own weekly Absolute Radio show, which yours truly has been a guest on, and he's written a book. Basically, if he ever decides to take six months off, he'll instantly create more jobs in the creative sector than the government has ever managed to do. How I pitched doing this to him was, how would you like to try narration? Pretty much the only job in the arts you've not done yet. He not only agreed to do it, but I think you're about to find out, he absolutely knocked it out of the park. Jason's voice has a natural warmth to it that you just can't fake. And I'm thrilled to bits with how this story turned out. Because this story, more than any story I've ever written, needed a proper Mancunian slash Salford voice. And that's what you're getting, ladies and gentlemen. This, I think we can say, is the first episode in Series 2 of the Stranger Times podcast, with weekly episodes kicking off in January, when, by the way, as luck would have it, the paperback of Book 1, cleverly called The Stranger Times, comes out in the UK. And it run well into February with new stories every week. Uh, and by the way, in case you're wondering, on February the 17th, 2022, book two of The Stranger Times, This Charming Man, comes out and is available in all good bookshops and some bad ones. Before that, though, I hope you enjoy this special story. 
I'm aware this is going to sound odd given what happened in the Christmas bits, but honestly, when researching this, I found quite a lot of stuff that cheered me up a bit. Right now, as we all know, the world is going through a bit of a difficult time, but reading about back in those days, about the heroism of everyday people taking care of their families and their communities as best they could, well, I think it's a timely reminder to all of us that the world has been through worse than anything we've seen and come out the other side okay. So there's a thought for you for this Christmas. You can explain to the kids when they're annoying you how back in the day they would have been up on top of a building in the cold waiting for bombs to fall from the sky with a bucket of sand for company. So, a Merry Christmas one and all from the Stranger Times and here is the brilliant Jason Manford reading Fire in the Skies. <laughs> Fire in the skies. The washing up. It's funny how the mind works, isn't it? That's my first memory of that night. The bloody washing up. It was one of my chores, you see. One of many. My dad was away at sea and my mum and older sister Katie were out working in the factories. So it fell to me to handle most of the cooking and cleaning. I didn't mind. I could see how tired they were when they got back from a shift and like everybody else... I wanted to do my bit. Don't get me wrong, I was 14 at the time. I was fully of the belief that what we needed to turn this war in our favour was me on the front lines, giving Hitler what for. That's the thing about being young. It never even occurs to you that you either will or won't get old. I'd just finished my Sunday dinner and I stood up so fast to grab my coat and kit bag off the hook by the door that I sent my chair tumbling over behind me. Nana pointed an accusatory finger at me and looked at me mum. Where's he off to? He's not done the washing up. He's supposed to do the washing up. Nana was not a woman to cross. She was my great-grandmother, and while we all loved her, it was mixed with a fair dollop of healthy fear. She would happily give you a clout with a stick if she thought you were doing something you shouldn't be, or that you were doing something you should too slowly or too sloppily. I don't want you to think badly of her, she just had a very set way of thinking about things. She could be very kind too. I was one of the few people who could make her laugh and when you did, it was a sound worth waiting for. She had a glorious wheezy chuckle and her whole face lit up just like a child on Christmas morning. I looked at mum who gave me the subtle nod that told me to get moving. She patted Nana's arm and spoke loudly. Don't worry about it, Nana. He's off doing an errand for me. Marty Draper has a line on a few eggs. You love an egg for breakfast, don't you? The second last thing I saw before going out the back door and grabbing my bicycle was the smile on Nana's little crinkly face as she thought about eggs for breakfast. The last thing I saw was the worried look in my mother's eyes. Nana was deaf. That's why she couldn't hear the air raid siren. In a few minutes, Mum would be taking her down to the shelter on Mealy Street. She just wanted to get me out the door first to stop Nana taking one of her turns. War had cost her a husband and a son already, and she would tell anyone that would listen that she was done with it. I was what they called a fire warden. The job was that you had to stand on top of your assigned building and keep an eye out for incendiary bombs. They gave us a bucket of sand and a pump, and our job was to deal with any fires the Luftwaffe were nice enough to send our way. It's not as ridiculous as it sounds. How raids generally worked was first they dropped the incendiaries and then they came back with the big boys because it was a lot easier to bomb a city when parts of it were on fire. It gave them something to aim at. It doesn't really matter about the old lads telling you to turn your lights out if there's a towering inferno up the street for the jerrys to take aim at. Pedalling as fast as I could towards the city centre. I should have been scared, terrified even. I was about to stand on top of a mill, defenceless, while the might of the Luftwaffe rained down death all around me. Honestly, though, I was thrilled. Like I said, 14. At that age, glory comes without consequence. I'd been waiting for this chance every night, almost praying for it. We'd had false alarms and all that, and each time I'd been disappointed not to see any action. I kept it to myself, of course, I had that much sense at least. Nobody wanted to hear my frustrations and I reckon Nana would wallop me silly if she heard. Dunkirk had been a few months previous. We were fighting a war 
losing it by Marty Draper from the shop's reckoning, and I was at home doing the washing up. Hard to believe now, but that's how I thought. I don't know what it is that makes young men long for war and old men grant their wishes, but the cycle plays out again and again. In my defence, it's not like I knew what to expect. It was the evening of December 22nd, 1940, and up until that point, we'd seen precious little bombing. There'd been pictures in the paper, of course, Sheffield, Coventry and Birmingham. But if ever there was something that a camera lens failed to capture in its awe-inspiring awfulness, it was the Blitz. Some people here had thought we were safe. It had been said that the Luftwaffe either couldn't or didn't want to pay us a visit. That was until the summer when the siren had gone off and we'd heard them overhead. Then, we knew. We were just as vulnerable as everybody else. Still, we'd only seen sporadic, low-level bombing up to that point. The first victim of it had been a bobby guarding a civil defence building in Salford. A big bundle of leaflets from Hitler telling us he wanted to be friends had failed to open and landed on his head. For the last couple of nights, Liverpool had been catching it bad and we'd been warned that there was every chance that we were next in the queue. My uncle Steve had been dispatched over there with his fire unit and he hadn't come back yet. I'd heard Mr Draper from the shop earlier in the day talking about how we were missing a load of our engines, meaning we were going to be caught short if the worst happened. What the siren meant was, the worst was here. As I pedalled my bike down Oxford Road, people were rushing around me trying to get themselves into shelters, while above us, tracer fire from anti-aircraft guns stitched across the night sky. Cars with netting covering the headlights were driving out of town, people keen to make sure their motors were out the line of fire. I took a left down Hume Street, pedalling for all I was worth. For a second, the siren stopped. I thought maybe it was a false alarm. But then they started up again, almost immediately. I threw my bike down at the back of Cholton New Mill, and with burning legs, I ran up the metal fire escape at the side of the building, up six stories to reach the roof. I stopped and looked up at the sky, my hands on my knees as I panted trying to catch my breath. You took your bloody time, didn't you? With a sense of dread, I turned to see old Ron Walker grimacing at me from the crate he always sat on. Truth be told, I didn't like the man. Uncle Steve had told me he used to be an alright fella, but he came back from the Great War changed. I don't know what he was before, but now he was an old codger with a limp and a mean disposition. He always smelled of booze and seemed to permanently be three days off his last shave and a week off his last bath. He had been an air raid warden, going about telling people to put out their lights, but he got into a fight with someone and they put him up here instead. We were supposed to split shifts, but a lot of the time when I turned up, he'd be here even when it wasn't his night. I reckon he'd been sleeping up here on some nights in the summer, but I didn't say anything. Not my place. Looks like you might finally see a bit of action, snarled Ron. Try not to wet your pants, eh? This was one of his recurring riffs, how I would wet me pants at the first sight of the enemy. I'll be fine. Ron gave a bitter laugh. Everyone says that until it happens. You wait and see. I ignored him, as me mum had told me to and I checked my gear instead. I moved across to the sheltered enclave, and I picked up my bucket of sand. I inspected my other equipment, taking the stirrup pump out of my kit bag and placing it beside the second bucket, the one containing water. I wore my whistle around my neck on a piece of string at all times. I left the gas mask in its cardboard box inside my kit bag. Satisfied, I turned my attention back to the sky. The unmistakable rumble of the engines, louder now, mingled in with the anti-aircraft fire above our heads. Suddenly, it all started to feel a whole lot more real and a whole lot less fun. Blimey, I said in a soft voice. This isn't another false alarm, is it? Then, I noticed flames over towards the centre of town. Ron, look at that! I reckon that's over near the town hall! I was shocked when Ron started laughing. The whole city might burn, lad. The whole city. I looked at him. 
His eyes were wide, and he shot me back a grin that was missing a few teeth and, to my mind, a few marbles and all. He was about to say something else, and then he noticed something over my shoulder. Oh, you fancy Dan Friend is back? I turned to look at the mill that sat on the far side of Cambridge Street. There were two factories over there. Directly opposite sat the Dunlop place, Macintosh Works. They made all manner of rubber stuff, same as us, and to the right was Hotspur Printing Press. To the left were some houses with a school behind them. There had been talk about them being knocked down and some new factories being built, but nobody was crazy enough to build something with a war on. Sure enough, there on the roof of the Macintosh Mill sat the man in a hat. That's how I referred to him. Ron had many other, less complimentary names. He'd been there a few times previously when there'd been false alarms. I never saw him come or go, but we'd just look over and there he'd be, sat on a deck chair of some sort on the roof opposite with his flask of tea and a newspaper. I didn't even know how he could read in this light, but he seemed to manage. The man seemed about the same age as Ron, but that was the only similarity. He looked proper posh, dressed in a fine wool coat and with a wide-brimmed hat on his head that you'd not see anyone walking around in day to day. When it rained, he had an umbrella he'd put up and he'd sit there, as nonchalant as you like, reading his newspaper, occasionally cleaning his glasses. He didn't even look up at the sky, which I considered a pretty fundamental part of the job. Still, he always waved back politely and despite the insults Ron would mutter darkly in his directions, I'd decided I liked the man, odd as he was. I looked over at him now and noticed something. You forgot your sand! The man gave me a quizzical look. I responded by holding up my bucket. Your sand, I repeated, for putting out the incendiaries. He smiled and nodded. I'm fine, thank you. Ron slapped me on the shoulder. What did I tell you? He's useless as a chocolate teapot. Them toffs all the same. He'll run at first sign of trouble. Then he grabbed me and excitedly pulled me close. Look! More fires! He gripped my neck so tight that it hurt as I looked out across the city. To the north of us, there were several blazes clearly visible against the night sky, and to the east, there was a few more too. Bloody hell, I said as I tried to move myself away from Ron. I I I think that's the Royal Exchange. I stood back, appalled, as Ron started to clap his hands and danced a little jig in a circle around me. It's all going to burn, it's all going to burn. I looked across at the man in the hat, who was watching Ron over his reading glasses. Despite him not being my responsibility, I felt embarrassed to be in any way associated with this unhinged maniac. I know I should feel sorry for him, but this wasn't the time. The city was in flames around me and and I'm stood there with just a bucket of sand to make sure our mill didn't burn too. I was going to have a word with Uncle Steve when he came back from Liverpool, see if I could get reassigned. I couldn't take Ron anymore. As he danced around me, I pleaded with him. Ron, calm down. We've got a job to do. Ron, for God's sake. I heard it before I saw it. A clunk followed by a whoosh. I turned to see that an incendiary had landed on the far end of the roof and a circle of fire was already taking hold. Bloody hell! I snatched up my bucket and started running towards it, but Ron grabbed me. Let go of me! No, he hollered, his breathing all funny now. Let it burn. What? Let. It. Burn. I didn't mean to, but... As I struggled to get away from him, my elbow came up and caught him a blow right on the nose, whipping his head backwards. I heard the sickening crack of bone and he released me as his hands shot up to cup his damaged hooter. I didn't have time to worry about him. I rushed forward with my bucket of sand and threw it on the flames. I did just like Uncle Steve taught me. Incendiaries contain phosphorus and magnesium, materials that burn brightly and are liable to explode if sprayed with water. You smother them with the sand, and any eventual outbreaks of fire could be extinguished with a stirrup pump in the bucket of water. The trick was to spread the sand all over the flames, denying the fire of the oxygen it needed. Then, when you've emptied the bucket, start stomping as fast as you can, and you might not even need the pump. 
I stomped for all it was worth. And it worked. It blimmin' worked. As I looked around watching the last of the flames going out, I felt elated. I'd done me job. And I didn't wet me pants at the first contact with the enemy either. This made me think of Ron. I turned to talk to him and he crashed into me, tackling us both to the ground. As I fell, I watched my bucket skitter over the edge of the roof and fall into the night. Then Ron was on top of me, his hands round me neck. I looked up to see his mouth covered in the thick blood that was flowing steadily from his destroyed nose and his grin looking utterly demented as his eyes wide with, I don't know, fear, anger, delight, all of the above bore down on me. I tried to speak but his hands were on my throat. I flailed at his arms yet they were still rock solid around my throat and then what happened next? Happened. Now, I realise this might seem impossible to rational thinkers, but I know what I saw. I saw the bomb. A proper bomb. Not an incendiary coming out of the sky and heading straight for us. There it was, clear as day. My own death heading straight for me. It didn't matter what Ron did, the mad old bastard. Hitler was going to get me first. There must have been something in my eyes because Ron, crazed as he was, turned his head and looked up towards the sky. I remember him making a gurgling noise and then I clamped my eyes shut. There was no prayer, no last words, no time for any of that, only nothing happened. Ron's hands went slack around my throat and then he fell back off me entirely. After a few moments, I opened one eye and looked. There was the bomb frozen in mid-air, maybe ten feet above my head. Ron lay on the ground prostrate before it, his hands held up around his head. No, God, no, please, no, not again, no! I looked around me, trying to regain my senses. The world still moved around us. I, I could see fires in all directions now as Manchester burned. I could hear shouts in the distance. The harsh smell of the chemicals from the incendiary and, and the feel of the sand on the roof beneath me. But the bomb still stayed there, frozen above our heads. I turned to look at the man in the hat. He was standing on the roof opposite with his arms raised above his head and a look of pained concentration on his face. I unsteadily got to my feet. Ron had curled himself into a ball and was shaking and blubbering intelligibly. I looked across at the man in the hat who spoke through gritted teeth. Is there anyone over in the school playground? I looked across. I don't think so. I felt a movement in the air and the bomb seemed to be a couple of feet closer now. His voice was strained. Could you be sure? Hang on. I am, came the terse reply. I rushed over to the far corner of the roof where Hume Street met Cambridge Street and looked across. It's... Yes, it's empty! I watched dumbfounded as the man slowly turned himself around and, in the air above us, the bomb moved with him. I remember thinking as I stood there with my mouth gaping that it moved at about the speed of one of them steam barges on the canal. I think I heard a ticking noise as it sailed over my head and across the road. Maybe just metal cooling down or depressurising. Then it moved silently over the top of the roofs of the houses and I held my breath. I knew a girl who lived there, Maggie Braithwaite. She'd once given me a gobstopper sweet when I'd fallen and scratched my knee. Finally, the bomb reached the middle of the playground and wobbled in the air above it. Still clear? shouted the man in the hat. Yes, I replied. Then hit the deck saw the man's entire body collapse with relief and then, after a second where it felt like the bomb itself seemed unsure of what it should do, it resumed falling. I dived and felt the shockwave wash over me as every window below me in the mill shattered. After a moment with my ears still ringing, I sat back up and looked across the street. The windows of the houses were blown in too, but they were otherwise all right. Same with the school. 
The smoke started to clear and I saw that there was now a massive smoking crater in the middle of the playground. The sheer power of the thing was terrifying to behold. I got back to my feet and looked around me, dazed. In every direction the skyline was orange and yellow with ravenous fires. To my right, I could see London Road Station burning, the flames licking against the night sky. The pathetic figure of old Ron lay crumpled on the ground, shaking and mumbling. I looked back at the man across the street. He was picking himself up, dusting his hat off and placing it back on his head. He raised an eyebrow and nodded across at me. Somehow, without shouting, his voice carried to me. You're a brave lad and you've done your duty. Time for you to head off now, I think. The Krauts are moving from incendiaries to the really nasty stuff. How did you... I started, not knowing how to phrase the question. A laugh without malice wafted across the night air to me. That, I'm afraid, is not something to be discussed. You're a smart lad. I think you know that it's best left between us. I nodded. Nobody will believe me anyway. <laughs> Quite right, he said. A young boy's flight of fancy. I pointed down at Ron. What about him? That poor blighter wouldn't even believe it himself. Best you get him to a shelter. I nodded. I looked across at the terrifying visage of a skyline in flames again and then turned back to the smoking crater across the road. I belatedly realised that I'd not even said thank you. Before I could... I noticed that the man in the hat was nowhere to be seen. I shook my head again. I saw it. Even I don't believe it. I walked across to where poor Ron was huddled. I know he attacked me and the rest, but I could feel nothing but pity for the poor wretch. I reached down my hand and took him by the elbow. Come on, Ron. Best be getting off. The, 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 he stammered. Yeah. Near miss that, I replied. Let's get you up. I helped him back to his feet. He grabbed my arm. I'm, I'm sorry. That's okay. All's well that ends well, eh? Our building's still standing. Lots aren't as lucky. I started walking him towards the fire escape steps. After a couple of moments, he stalled and said what I'd already smelled. I think I peed myself. It's all right, Ron, I said. Patting his arm. It happens. Thank you for listening to the Stranger Times podcast. If you enjoyed it, then please leave a rating wherever you get your pods. The Stranger Times series of books by C.K. McDonnell are available right now in all good bookshops. Check out thestrangertimes.com for loads more fun stuff and to sign up for the newsletter, where just for subscribing, you'll get yourself a sweet free ebook containing some Stranger Times short stories. This podcast is produced by Rob B at B E, with Ed Wilson and Wonder Wife exec producing, and all materials are copyright McFory Inc. Limited. All of the short stories written by me, C.K. McDonald, and the music is done by Alan McGuire with John McCullough as musical Sven Gallagher.